Good morning, and welcome to another episode of Smart Fox News. Thank you. Sorry about that. That never happened. All right. I edited that out. That never happened. Today, we're going to test my mind a little bit. Never done a video like this one. You know, I always crack jokes every time, but this is all about the brain. Now, I'm pretty smart. You know, I've worked with Dexter, Jimmy Neutron, Rick Sanchez. I worked with all of them. But now, this video is called The Hardest Problem on the Hardest Test. I'm gonna put my mind to the test today. Let's get to it. I know you guys, this might not be the most exciting video, but I'm gonna show you how smart I am. All right. So if you ever want, so if you ever want me to do your homework for you, I got you. Well, I'll at least help you. Cause I, I can't really be doing it for you. Unless you pay me. You guys know about the Putnam? It's a math competition for undergraduate students. Hold on. It's a six hour long test that just has 12 questions broken up into two different three hour sessions. And each one of those questions is scored one to 10. So the highest possible score would Yo, be 120. And yet, despite the fact that the only students taking this thing each year are those who clearly are already pretty interested in math, the? the median score tends to be around one or two. So it's a hard test. Okay. And on each one of those sections of six questions, the problems tend right, to get it. harder as you go from one to six. Although, of course, difficulty is in the eye of the beholder. Yo, but the thing about those I fives and sixes confused. is that what even the though they're heck? positioned as those the hardest sim- problems, on, on I need to pause this. Those are symbols I'd never seen before. Yo, what was that? Okay, let's just. Really hard test. Quite often, these are the ones with the yeah, most elegant solutions going. available. Some subtle shift in perspective that transforms it from very challenging to doable. Here, I'm going to share with you one problem that came up as the sixth question on one of these tests a while back. And those of you who follow the channel, you know that rather than just jumping straight to the solution, which in this case would be surprisingly short, when possible, I like to take the time to walk you through how you might have stumbled across the solution yourself, where the insight comes from. That is, make a video more about the problem-solving process than about the problem used to exemplify it. So anyway, here's the question. If you choose four random points on a sphere and consider the tetrahedron with these points as its vertices, what is the probability that the center of the sphere is inside that tetrahedron? Go ahead, take a moment and kind of digest this question. Whoa, whoa. That, that's a tough question. I have to do, that's gonna take me like an hour to do. Okay. You might start thinking about which of these tetrahedra Can't contain the sphere center, here. which ones don't, how you might systematically distinguish the two. It's not that and hard. how do we even approach a problem like this, right? Where do you even start? Well, it's usually a good idea to think about simpler cases, so let's knock things down to two dimensions, where you'll choose three random points on a circle, and it's always helpful to name things, so let's call these guys P1, P2, and P3. The question is, what's the probability that the triangle formed by these points contains the center of the circle? I think you'll agree it's way easier to visualize now, but it's still a hard question. So again, you ask, is there a way to simplify what's going on? Get ourselves to some kind of foothold that we can build up from? Well, maybe you imagine fixing P1 and P2 in place and only letting that third point vary. And when you do this and you play around with it in your mind, You might notice that there's a special region, a certain arc, where when P3 is in that arc, the triangle contains the center, otherwise not. Specifically, if you draw lines from P1 and P2 through the center, these lines divide up the circle into four different arcs. And if P3 happens to be in the one on the opposite side as P1 and P2, the triangle has the center. If it's in any of the other arcs, though, no luck. We're assuming here that all of the points of the circle are equally likely. So what is the probability that P3 lands in that arc? It's the length of that arc divided by the full circumference of the circle. 
the proportion of the circle that this arc makes up. So what is that proportion? Obviously, that depends on where you put the first two points. I mean, if they're 90 degrees apart from each other, then the relevant arc is one quarter of the circle. But if those two points were farther apart, that proportion would be something closer to a half. And if they were really close together, that proportion gets closer to zero. So Is think about this for a moment. P1 and test. P2 are chosen randomly, with every point on the circle being equally likely. So what is the average size of this relevant arc? Yo, my brain's hurting. <laughs> my brain's actually Maybe you imagine crazy. fixing P1 in Holy place, crap. and just considering all the places that P2 might be. All of the possible angles between these two lines, every angle from 0 degrees up to 180 degrees, is equally likely. So every proportion between 0 and 0 0.5 is equally likely. And that means that the average proportion is 0 0.25. So if the average size of this arc is a quarter of the full circle, the average probability that the third point lands in it is a quarter. And that means that the overall probability that our triangle contains the center is a quarter. What the? But can we extend this into the three-dimensional case? If you imagine three out of those four points just being fixed in place, which points of the sphere can the fourth one be on so that the tetrahedron that they form contain the center of the sphere? Just like before, let's go ahead and draw some lines from each of those fixed three points through the center of the sphere. And here, it's also helpful if we draw I'm about to, I'm about to call Dexter real quick. Hold on. Hey, yo. Okay, okay, okay. Dexter is not helpful at all. Planes that are determined by any pair of these lines. Now what these planes do, you might notice, is divide the sphere into eight different sections, each of which is a sort of spherical triangle. And our tetrahedron is only going to contain the center of the sphere if the fourth point is in the spherical triangle on the opposite side as the first three. Dude, okay, now, okay. unlike the 2D case, it's pretty difficult to think about the average size of this section as we let the initial three points vary. What am I watching? Those of you with some multivariable calculus under your belt might think, let's just try a surface integral. And by all means, pull out some paper and give it a try. But it's not easy. And of course it should be difficult. I'm I mean, this is a reaction video. I didn't button. know this. What do you expect? I didn't sign up for all this. And what do you even do with that? Well, one thing you can do is back up to the two-dimensional case and contemplate if there is a different way to think about the same answer that we got. That answer, one-fourth, looks suspiciously clean, and it raises the question of what that four represents. I guess one of the main reasons I wanted to make a video about this particular problem is that what's about to happen carries with it a broader lesson for mathematical problem solving. Think about those two lines that we drew for P1 and P2 through the origin. Okay. They made the problem a lot easier to think about. And in general, so really whenever you like added something to the problem setup this that makes it this conceptually easier, hard. see if you can reframe the entire question in terms of those things that you just added. In this case, rather than thinking about choosing three points randomly, start by saying, choose two random lines that pass through the circle center. For each line, there's two possible points that it could correspond to. So just flip a coin for each one to choose which of the endpoints is going to be P1 and likewise for the other, which endpoint is going to be P2. Choosing a random line and flipping a coin like this is the same thing as choosing a random point on the circle. Yeah, it just sure. feels a little bit convoluted at first. But the reason for thinking about the random process this way is that things are actually about to become easier. We'll still think about that third point, P3, as just being a random point on the circle. Yo, you but imagine that it was chosen question? before you do the two coin flips. And he said... Because you see, he's not even the two done yet. And that each one being equally minutes. likely. But one and only four one of those still, four outcomes still leaves P1 and P2 on the opposite side of the circle as P3, with the triangle that they form containing the center. So no matter where those two lines end up and where that P3 ends up, it's always a one fourth chance that the coin flips leave us with a triangle containing the center. Yeah, we're well, that's very us Good luck. Just by reframing Good how luck. we think about the random process for choosing points, the answer one quarter popped out in a very different way from how it did before. And importantly, this style of argument generalizes seamlessly up into three dimensions. Again, instead of starting off by picking four random points, imagine choosing three random lines through the center of the sphere, and then some random point for P4. 
Five that first line five. passes Why through the spirit two points, so flip a coin to decide that? which of those two points is going to be P1. This? Likewise, for each of the other lines, flip a coin to decide where P2 and P3 end up. Now, there's eight equally likely outcomes of those coin flips, but one on on and only either. one of them is going to place P1, P2, and P3 on the opposite side of the center as P4. So one and only one of these eight equally likely outcomes gives us a tetrahedron that contains the center. Again, it's kind of subtle how that pops out to us, but isn't that elegant? Whoa. This is a valid solution to the problem, but admittedly, the way that I've stated it so far rests on some visual intuition. If you're curious about how you might write it up in a way that doesn't rely on visual intuition, I've left a link in the description to one such write-up in the language of linear algebra, if you're curious. And this is pretty common in math, where having the key insight and understanding is one thing, but having the relevant background to articulate that a student tries to cheat off of his neighbor, choosing randomly which neighbor to cheat from. Now, circle all of the off. students that don't. This is why you shouldn't cheat, kids. Wait, you're, you're, in a, you're in a Zoom room. How are you going to cheat? I mean, you could text them. Don't, 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 don't take any ideas from me. Don't take any ideas from me. Don't do that. I'm watching y'all. Have somebody cheating off of their test. What is the expected number of such circled students? Oh, so you all had to figure out this question? Look at all the credit. credits. They all had to figure out this question. It's a, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. That is a whole lot of people to figure out that one question. They was all in the lab like, what's this? What's this? How, how are we going to figure this out? Anyway. Um, yeah, that really, that really gave me like a brain cramp just watching that whole video. So I hope you all learned something in this video. I'll probably need to watch it like at least 10 more times to really get it. <laughs> but anyways, thank you for watching Smart Fox TV. Give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Time for our trivia today. Which fast food chain once tested bubblegum broccoli as a children's menu item? Is it A, Burger King, B, McDonald's, C, Carl's Jr., or D, Wendy's? Stick around to find out. Hello, this is Tracy with your Smart Fox News. Meet the winners of the Parents Magazine America's Kindest Family Contest. Luke and Holly Barron, who lost their son, Keaton, to cancer in 2008, are continuing his legacy. And ever since, the couple have worked tirelessly to continue Keaton's legacy by helping others through their foundation, the K-Club. The foundation, which was Keaton's idea, primarily helps children fighting cancer and their families. It is also committed to doing random acts of kindness while in the hospital. Founding members of Keaton wrote that the club's mission is to be kind to others, be courageous, compassionate, and caring. The November cover of Parents Magazine celebrates their kindness as the winners of the first ever Kindest Family in America contest. That's all for Smart Fox News. Hope you all have a good day. Welcome back to our trivia section. So which fast food chain once tested bubblegum broccoli as a children's menu item? Is it A, Burger King, B, McDonald's, C, Carl's Jr., or D, Wendy's? If you picked B, McDonald's, you are correct. Of course, it didn't go through. Thanks for playing. Hey, Cam, this is Tracy. Hi, this is Sally. And thanks for watching Smartbox TV. Stay, Stay bossy. bossy.